uh, is my screen visible? Uh, yes, it is. So I think few people are asking how to join. Uh, I think few, few, few people are facing some problem in joining. Are all of them on Teams? I think the link is on Could we send a link? We'll be waiting two more minutes, then we'll start. started. Okay. Uh, 
so I'm starting. So uh, this is the session introduction to nuclear physics. So we'll be discussing more about nuclear physics. So I'll be discussing half of it and the rest will be covered by Babavidi. So yeah. So if I uh, talk about like just to put it simply, uh, nuclear physics is a study of atomic nucleus. So it's a bit different from uh, what we study in atomic or molecular physics. Uh, because uh, in nuclear physics, we talk a way deeper. So if we talk about the emergence of nuclear physics, so it emerged around 100 years or so. So the historic discovery was the discovery of radioactivity. So before knowing more about nuclear physics, let's see the timeline or the history of nuclear physics. Yeah. So here comes the timeline or the history that led to the emergence of nuclear physics. So at first there was the discovery of radioactivity by uh, Betterill. So post to that experiment, uh, like where many researchers were done by Marie Curie, Pierre Curie and Rutherford, that revealed that radioactivity was a very different kind of phenomena. Like if we compare to normal chemical reactions or chemical phenomena, then radioactivity was a bit different. We'll be uh, reading about uh, more about radioactivity in our later slides. So that's what led to the emergence of nuclear physics. Now, secondly, if we talk about the uh, discovery of electron, which was uh, by J.J. Thompson, you all must be knowing. So his experiments revealed that uh, the atom itself had some kind of structure and it is made of up of particles called electrons. Now around 1905, if I talk about the major discovery, uh, Albert Einstein published a few papers and the groundbreaking discovery which came out of that was the uh, energy mass equivalence. We all know E is equal to mc square. So this is a very, very important uh, formula in nuclear physics. We'll be studying about it and we'll be solving some numericals uh, related to that uh, a bit later. Now, next, if we move to one more discovery, which was uh, by Rutherford's gold foil experiment, then his Rutherford's alpha scattering experiment, he bombarded, uh, he took a gold thin gold foil and he bombarded alpha particles. So he observed many things. First thing was that majority went undeviated, but a uh, few caused deviations. And he also observed a few uh, alpha lines which uh, deviated uh, at, a, at an angle of 180 degree. So by computing all, all these things, he proposed that uh, uh, he proposed the planetary model of the atom. So like in solar system, he proposed that nucleus would be uh, around in the center, the tiny, dense, positively charged nucleus and atoms in atoms, electrons would be revolving around it. So this is what he proposed. And since then, there were many theories like and also uh, a discovery of other subatomic particles like neutrons and all. And there was also one more Yukova's theory which told about the nuclear force that holds the nucleus together. So this is all about you can keep the other things in your mind. So if I go and see that why should we study nuclear physics? Why nuclear physics? So the clear answer, the clear picture is that first the fundamental understanding. Like if we want to understand the fundamental building blocks of this universe, right? If we want to know about the, if we want to get the insights of the fundamental laws of nature and structure of the universe, or if we want to know about the interactions of the subatomic particles, then of course we can study nuclear physics and we can come up with various answers. Secondly, if we move to astronomical astronomy or cosmology, 
then the essen it's essential for studying the processes that occur in stars, such as like nuclear fission, or it also contributes to the understanding of stellar evolution and cosmological models. So, and one more very important applications is that uh, medical physics, because uh, nuclear physics is uh, used in medical physics. Uh, it has enormous appli enormous application in it. It is used in various uh, diagnostic techniques, and uh, you people must have heard about the radiation therapy for cancer, so which use, uh, uses nuclear physics. Now, there are uh, many um, theories. We'll be studying about it, interaction theories, and also nuclear technology. If we talk about the nuclear reactors or detectors, radiation detectors. So these are the key problems, and I think nuclear physics has come up with the solutions to it. So that's why nuclear physics. And one more thing which uh, shows like this, just like in this picture, which shows the link of the nuclear physics to like many physics, uh, field of physics, atomic, astrophysics, or if we explain about the systems, many body systems, then we can study about nuclear physics and there are various terms written. So you must be knowing about these. These are the basic terms like nucleons when we talk about protons and neutrons together and some terms isotopes and all. And here comes one more thing. Um, this curve you might be thinking about this, but I'll be explaining it a bit later. And <clears throat> let's move towards study the properties of nucleus, right? So yeah. So I'll be teaching you the four properties, first four properties. These are very important, so let's go into it and study about the mass and the size. So I think uh, you must be knowing that uh, how, how to estimate something, like how small is the nucleus? So I cannot say that the nucleus is very small. I should specify that how small is the nucleus. So um, the first estimate comes from the Rutherford's uh, scattering experiment. Um, Rutherford estimated and he approximated and he said that the size of uh, nucleus is almost, it's, it's, it's less than 10 raised to the power minus 14. So this is what the first estimation which he gave. But uh, like if we like today, we know the nucleus, the size of the nucleus of hydrogen atom and the radius of it. Like if we calculate the ratio, right? So first thing uh, um, you must be knowing or uh, like the radius, uh, what is Bohr's radius? So it is nothing but the distance at which the nearest electron of the hydrogen atom ex exists. So this is called Bohr's radius. So if I talk about hydrogen atom, its value is equal to 0 0.529 angstrom or approximately if I take it at 0 0.53 angstrom. And we know the value of uh, uh, radius of nucleus of hydrogen atom is uh, equal to 0 0.8 uh, femtometer. So 0 0.8 femtometer means uh, 0 0.8 into 10 raised to the power minus 15. So the funny thing comes here that uh, suppose if we calculate the ratio of these two. So if I calculate the ratio of the Bohr's radius to the nucleus radius, then we'll get a very huge, uh, like a huge number, which is like um, I have calculated. That's why I know. Uh, so it's almost equal to 62,000. Like it's uh, the value is 62,500. So you can see that the hydrogen nucleus is 62,000, about 62,000 smaller than the atom itself, which shows its estimation that how small and how tiny is the nucleus from the bigger atom, right? And now, uh, like since various experiments were done, so one very important conclusion that came from various kinds of experiments, like different experiments like electron scattering or alpha decay, that the, this is very important. You should mark this point that the, the nuclear charge and the nuclear matter radii are nearly equal. So it comes from the experiments. 
the nuclear charge and matter radii are nearly approximately equal. And also the protons and the neutrons, the way they are distributed in an atom, um, like in the nucleus, if I talk about nucleus, sorry. So the way they are distributed, these are uniform. These are uniformly distributed. OK, so and also one more thing which uh, is very important that that should be discussed. Like you must, you must be seeing this curve, right? Wait, just a minute. Yeah, so you must be seeing this curve here. So what does it tell about? So first of all, we'll know about. Let's talk about nucleus and its shape, right? So even though we talk about nucleus as a spherical object, not necessarily it's it's a sphere, right? So like most of the nucleus are the aggregates or collection of smaller particles like protons and neutrons. This might not resemble a sphere. Like it does not have a spherical boundary boundary either, because our nucleus do not have a sharp boundary. Just this is a very important point. Our nucleus does not have a sharp boundary. It's like for our like sake of uh, understanding or like ease of calculation and to get more information about the nucleus, we consider it to be somewhat spherical, but it is not like need not to be spherical, right? The nucleus. So and it does not have a sharp boundary. Now, now if we plot this curve uh, and like the graph between nuclear charge density and the radius, OK, so we will that just like I have told that since the nucleus does not have a sharp boundary, that's why something like this is coming. So the nuclear density falls along a slope near a surface. Now it is falling along a slope near a surface. Just the explanation for this is that is the nucleus does not have a sharp boundary. And if I see uh, the region where there is a 90 percent uh, charge density, so it is coming to about suppose at some R1, OK, so at 90 percent charge density uh, is coming at some R1 and suppose uh, the point one, the point one density is coming at somewhat R2, suppose, then the difference between R1 and R2 uh, gives somewhat some T, which is like people call it skin thickness, which tells about the density. The varies the difference in density when we are at 90% when there is 90% charge density and when there is 1% charge de density, right? And somewhat in the middle, which is known as the mean radius, we define it to be R, so which is at 50% charge density. Okay, so these are the observation. So one more observation is that you must see that it is almost constant the density is almost constant in the entire volume of nucleus. It's a very important concept, but uh, it's kind of a peculiar property because if if you suppose if you suppose I talk about Earth, right? So if I dig, if I start digging in the surface of the Earth, then we'll see that uh, the matter density increases and we know that the matter density is highest at the center, but this is not in the case of nucleus. But why is it happening with the Earth? Because there is gravity and gravity is the central force. OK, it attracts all the matter particle towards a particular center. OK, so that's where the matter density and the pressure builds up and it increases. But if I go through the nucleus, if I go from one point to other or towards the center, then the density remains the same. It remains the constant. So this is what uh, some uh, due to some different force which acts, which is known as the uh, nuclear force, strong nuclear force. So it is, of course, different from gravity and also it's not a central force. And uh, nuclear force acts. With uh, acts between neutrons, 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 protons, and it, it's like a glue that holds the nucleus together and since from this concept uh, we know we have stated that the rho remains constant then we can directly write one more thing that since rho is constant then we can write rho as mass upon volume so i'm repeating that we can write since rho is constant we can write rho as the mass upon volume and we can replace the mass by mass number which is a 
suppose and upon volume, which is since we have considered sphere, so we can consider the volume. We can write the volume as four upon three pi r cube. So a upon pi r cube is a constant. So we can see that the radius is uh, proportional to a mass number raised to the power one upon three. So yeah, so this is the charge distribution which comes from the uh, from the graph itself, which shows that the density remains constant. And uh, the value of the constant, according to like various experiments, it is uh, approximately equal to 1.2 femtometer. So we can write R is equal to R naught A raised to the power one upon three, which is the formula. Now R naught is approximately equal to 1.2 femtometer. So this is like all about this graph. And uh, also one more thing is that uh, which you should, uh, which is like everyone thinks that uh, if you take a nucleus and if you break it apart into various constituent particles, then you will see that the mass of new, uh, you should think that the mass of nucleus should be equal to the mass of each and every constituent particle. But uh, I think it is not the case, right? Uh -huh. So I think it's not the case. But why is it so? So we can see clearly see with one example. So suppose uh, you have this uh, deuterium atom, OK? So and its mass is given to be this, right? Its mass is there. Now, if I break down into its constituent particles, then we'll be having one proton and neutron. Then mass of the hydrogen atom is given to be this proton and the neutron is this. Now we add up, then we are getting the total mass as this. Now see the difference. The mass is not coming to be the same, right? Here we can see, right? We are now we are studying about some new con concept, which is very important about binding energy and mass defect, right? So we can see clearly that no, there is some mass difference, but why is it coming? Where is this extra mass coming from or why is the, this one is less than this? OK, so here we define one new concept which is known as the mass defect, which is defined as the difference of the expected mass and the actual mass. So suppose this is the value which we are getting if we are considering this particular example, then this is the mass defect. OK, and uh, now here there is a very important one formula by Einstein, which is the uh, mass energy equivalence, and which says, which explains uh, that uh, uh, how mass and energy are can be converted. Because see, one particular explanation for this is that when the deuterium atom was formed in the first place, okay, so from its constituent particles, from then there was a huge energy release okay so actually how could people explain then one possible explanation was that that when the deuterium atom was formed in the first place from its constituent particles huge amount of energy was released in the process then that energy might have gone to that like corresponded to that mass defect then mass defect can be converted to that energy. Then we talk about the mass energy equivalence of Einstein, which is E is equal to del M C square. So for one atomic mass unit, the energy um, came to be 931.49 mega electron volt. Then again, for that particular mass defect, we can simply multiply and we can see that it corresponded to that amount of energy. Like one possible explanation is that if I break apart this due to particles, right, then I require this amount of energy to do so. Or initially, when deuterium atom was formed, this amount of energy which was released, okay, so we can say that, okay, this can correspond to this mass defect. But how can we say that? Can we test it? Can we test this hypothesis? Then yes, there is an answer. So there is uh, one test for uh, one like thing for testing this hypothesis that uh, one experiment which was carried out 
that we bombarded a deuterium nucleus with gamma photons, but energy we kept it as same as 2.224 mega electron volt. Yes, the energy was kept to be same. So when deuterium was bombarded with this kind of energy gamma photons, then we'll see that it will break apart. So thus our statement was 100% correct. And we saw that it broke apart. Now, one, two, three questions might, co might come in your mind that uh, what would happen if the energy is less than uh, the given energy? Then nothing, nothing happens. And uh, if the energy is more, then this might um, contribute the, to the kinetic energy of the resulting species so like neutron and, and hydrogen. But yeah, so this statement came to be correct. And uh, also there is one very important concept which uh, came, which is the binding energy. Yes, so which is the binding energy. So we can define binding energy like the amount of energy that I need to provide to break apart the, uh, the assembly of particles from the nucleus and work against the strong nuclear force, right? So it is called the binding energy. So also it is manifested when the nucleus was formed in the first place. So, and also that energy release corresponding to mass defect, which that's why we can say that the total amount of mass is less than the sum, sum of all constituent particles. So this is the explanation. And also we can see the binding energy formula. Yeah, so we can see the yeah so this is the binding energy formula yeah so this is for any element suppose this is the number of neutrons a minus z and this is the binding energy formula and uh, right so number of protons and neutrons the mass of neutrons and the total mass of the element so if you multiply it with this amount of energy we get the binding energy okay now I hope this concept is uh, clear. Now let's move to that curve. Let's move to study about that curve. Yeah. So the uh, yeah. So this. So it is the graph between the number of neutrons, as you can see, is the graph between the number of neutrons and the number of protons. Okay. So why have we plotted this graph? What does it depict? So the simple question is that if I take any mass number A, suppose any ma mass number which is 25, and if I write the corresponding neutron and the proton uh, number, like what could be the possible neutron number and the proton number? Suppose if I write. So for 25, we can write various possible combination. So if I write all the 24 combinations, suppose when N is equal to one and uh, proton is equal to 24. When n is equal to 2, proton is 23. Just like that, if I write all the combination. So does all kinds of combi, do all kinds of combination exist in nature? This is the question that uh, do these things, everything from uh, stable nucleus? So the answer is that uh, uh, no, not everything uh, forms a stable nucleus. But uh, we can study what uh, proton and neutron pair can form a stable nuclei. So what decides the number of protons and uh, proton, uh, neutrons pair is this curve, simply. This curve decides everything. Now, uh, we can see that for smaller, like less than 20, I guess. Yeah, so for less than 20, the neutron and the number of protons number is almost coinciding with the straight line and also one more thing which I want to mention the straight line this black line is n is equal to z line which shows the number of protons is equal to neutrons and there is some dark zigzag wavy patterns which shows the stable nucleide this is deviating like this like my pointer is moving like this I think you might see so it's kind of st stability curve OK, so for less than 20 atomic nuclei, I can see that um, the graph coincides with the straight line almost, which shows that for stable nuclei formation, 
n should be equal to z. Now what happens when uh, we increase the mass number? So as we can see from this graph, as we increase the mass number, the number of neutrons starts exceeding the number of protons. OK, so there is a very good explanation for this and why should it happen and why does it happen? But before that, I can also explain the things in the blue region and the things in the orange region it, uh, which do not lie in the stability curve. So to come under this stability curve, it can undergo decays, right? That's why we have mentioned types of decays. So to come under this stability curve, it can uh, either undergo beta decay or other kinds of decays. Like if we have number excess number of protons or excess number of neutrons, then it can undergo beta decay to come to the stable energy level, right? And uh, yeah. So yeah, one more observation which I was discussing about that. Why is the graph going like this after that for larger uh, mass number? So if I talk about the forces in the nucleus, there are two kinds of forces. First is strong nuclear force, like nuclear force, and the other is Coulomb repulsion. So Coulomb repulsion act between protons and strong nuclear force acts between all kinds of particles, right? And it's attractive. So Coulomb repulsion tries to break the nucleus apart and nuclear force tries to bind everything. So how strong is the nuclear force? If I talk about its strength, then it is very, very strong only at extremely like extremely short distances. Uh, of what range you can say approximately of few femtometers. So it comes it, it dominates. It, dominant over all forces like if we talk about uh, mainly here columbing force then it dominates over columbic force at very short distances so for small nucleus nucleus sizes we can say that strong nuclear force dominates over columbic force columbic repulsion now what happens if i talk about a very uh, big or bigger nucleus so here we have a large number of protons and a large number of neutrons. So there might be a case uh, where there is no strong nuclear attraction between neutron at one end and neutron at the other end, because since both of them are a bit uh, farther apart, then the nuclear, the strong nuclear force will not act, right? But still the proton, proton and neutron, proton forces are acting, but between those to particular neutrons, the strong nuclear force do not does not act, right? But in the case of columbic force, even if the protons are apart or at the other ends of the atom, still that columbic force, repulsive force acts. So the main thing is that that's why the, for, this is for this repulsive force. We add number of neutrons or uh, there is more number of neutrons that should compensate for the sake of this particular repulsive force. That's why we need more number of neutrons, we excess of neutrons to compensate and make the atom, uh, make the nuclear stable. So this is the explanation why uh, uh, neutrons exceed as we go to a larger atomic number. So there, there is a explanation. And also, since we have talked about uh, binding energy. Yeah. So since we have talked about binding energies, density and mass relations. I think you can answer this. Why is the density almost constant? So yeah, so since we have talked about binding energy, let's talk about something which is uh, very important and uh, it is required in like mainly if I talk about astrophysics and other kind of physics. So and in different kinds of reactions where to understand fusion and fission, we need to study this curve. So this is a curve which is binding energy per nucleon versus mass number. But before that, we should know about what is binding energy per nucleon. See, we, will, we have studied binding energy, right? For smaller nuclear, we know that binding energy is less. And since like the atom can become heavy, so its binding energy can also increase. 
of course, since the number of neutrons increases, right? And of course, atomic number increases, then its binding energy will increase. So this is not the clear estimate of stability. To know about the stability, to know about different, uh, uh, to get the different ideas of different kinds of nuclei, we can deal, we can study binding energy per nucleon. So if we calculate the binding energy per nucleon, we can, we can get to know the uh, stability of particular nuclei. And uh, see, this is the curve. So see, let's divide this curve into two sections about iron, um, about this iron um, Fe. So we have divided this uh, sections. So we can see that for very less uh, mass numbers like hydrogen and all, it is very less. Binding energy per nuclear has a very less value. So if uh, it increases for alpha particle, helium, then carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. In this region, if you uh, say, uh, if you talk about carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, you can see some peaks, some recurring peaks. So for alpha particle or some beryllium, uh, sorry, boron, carbon, there is some peak peaks we, you can see. So why is that peak? So there are mass numbers, first of all, these are the multiple of four, and these contains equal number of neutrons and proton. Since these contain equal number of neutrons and protons, so these contain, these form stable nuclei, uh, if um, like compared to their neighbors. So that's why, since it increases, so that's why it, we can see the peaks here, right? And also one more thing, in the left side of this region, right, left side of Fe, if we see. Um, so suppose if we take two nuclei and if it combines and form a bigger or a moderate to bigger nuclei, nucleus, then what happens? So what happens is that since in this region, the binding energy per nucleon is increasing, then that will lead to formation of a stable nucleus and that will release energy okay and one more thing that you should keep in your mind yeah so yeah this one this is very important that lesser binding energy per nucleon if it is changed to higher binding energy it will release energy it's very important. Some lesser binding energy nucleon value, if it is changed to higher binding energy, then it will release energy. Yes. So if I take two nuclei and if these are fused to form a moderate or higher, then it will release a huge amount of energy. So this is known as fusion reaction. And on the other side, if we come to the right side, we can see that the binding energy after Fe, it decreases, right? So if I uh, take a big, a big nucleus and if it breaks into two, suppose two smaller daughter nuclei, then again it will tend to release since the binding energy is increasing. So it will release energy. So in both the cases, it will release energy. So an Fe, as you can see from the graph, it is a region of very stable nuclei. It forms a region of stable nuclei. And one more thing about uh, iron, which I can discuss, is that uh, when a massive star reaches the stage of iron fusion in its in its core, then fusion reaction ceases. Um, so the explanation can be given from this curve also, like because the fusion of the iron requires iron ne nucleus requires an input of energy rather than releasing energy. So this is very important. So it since it requires energy rather than releasing energy. So the nuclear fusion stops there. And also iron marks the end of nuclear fusion in a massive stars. And it causes like it leads to core collapse and subsequent supernova. So which can be explained. So, yeah. So Till now, I think it's clear for you.
so i think i have completed my section uh, i'll continue from here can you anushka can you change my uh, status to organizer because otherwise i don't think i'm allowed to present I think you can present now. Yeah. I think I'm going to screen it and share it here. You can see, guys, you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah. 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 we can see. Yeah. Okay, so which problem is it? I'm sure you should finish binding energy mass and nuclear distribution. Okay, I'll uh, finish some more of the nuclear uh, properties and not as much in details as Anushka uh, went with the other introductory. Uh, I'll briefly introduce you all to things like nuclear spin and parity and then to nuclear shapes, which are dependent on like nuclear orbital moments and type of moments. After that, we'll discuss some of the nuclear, two of the nuclear models and move on to one discussing one radioactive decay specifically, that's alpha decay. And mostly that's how it's going to be the brief, I think. I'll finish up in like 20, 25 minutes or so. Okay. So uh, nuclear spin and parity, these are two important factors in the sense that uh, all uh, the radioactive decay decays are uh, all nuclear transitions that happens from uh, one particular nuclear level to another level are very much dependent on both these parameters. And these parameters are conserved or uh, this nuclear decays that happens are dependent in, uh, on this in the sense that the spin and parity are always or conserving this reaction or the, or the decays that uh, are the decays which conserve spin and parity are more probable than the other DJs which can, uh, which did not conserve these properties. So nuclear spin, uh, nuclear spin, there are, there are two different types of it. So one will arise directly from the intrinsic, uh, intrinsic neutron and proton spin. The intrinsic one, which you know, which again arises due to spin of the quarks, which are inside neutrons and protons. So quarks have their intrinsic spin of like plus or minus half and based on it, Neutrons and protons. protons have intrinsic spin of plus and minus half. But then, uh, when you fill up this nucleus, neutrons and protons in the nuclear shells, uh, they have their specific angular momentum. And based on this orbital angular momentum, the spin is uh, uh, spin arises based on this angular momentum, and which is given by this particular con. It's just represented by spin i. This is supposed to be capital I. Uh, okay. So there are, now, there are three different types of uh, nuclear configurations that we can have. One is even, 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 even is the one where you have uh, even atomic number and even number of neutrons. And uh, well, the odd, where the other kind of is the odd atomic number and the even uh, neutron number. While uh, the third configuration is where both of those neutrons and the number of neutrons and protons are in odd. So in the even even uh, selection, the intrinsic uh, the spin if you calculate it goes to zero because uh, uh, the shells are filled up in such a way that you have plus minus half protons pairing up with the plus and minus half. But the same happens in the case of neutron. 
uh, in case of uh, the odd, there is the in, in case of the odd number of protons, we'll have one extra proton that is remaining, which will give rise to half integer spin. While uh, in case of both odd and odd configuration, we'll have integral spin in the sense that if you have one proton remaining, one uh, and one neutron remaining, both of their spin will add up and give you an integral spin. Uh, the parity, uh, second half of uh, the spin uh, of this property is dependent on parity as well. So I think in particle physics also we'll talk about parity. Parity is uh, if you simply consider it changes the uh, sign of your uh, uh, let me see, uh, uh, position the, of your wave function. So you have a wave function uh, as a function of x, y, and z, position x, y, and z. Then if you change its parity, if it's uh, if, uh, if the parity is negative, then you'll have your wave function as a function of minus x, uh, wave function as minus minus x or uh, minus y minus z. And if your parity is uh, positive, then both of this uh, minus uh, wave function in terms of x, y, z will be equivalent to wave function in terms of minus x, minus y, minus z. Well, if your parity is negative, you'll have the opposite, where you'll have an extra negative sign that is a uh, wave function of x, y, z would be minus of wave function of minus x, minus y, minus z. Uh, now, this parity is dependent on spin in the sense that uh, your parity is given by this particular total parity is given by this particular formula, which is minus 1 raised to L. L is the total angular momentum, uh, and which is, again, related to the spin. So both this parity and spin go hand in hand in this sense. And what you have is, uh, uh, while the intrinsic parity of both protons and neutrons is uh, plus 1, but when they combine, when, when they combine inside a nuclear, you have this total parity, which is given by minus 1 raised to the total angular momentum, L. So most of the times, the stable nuclei tend to pair up in such a way that uh, the, the system has zero spin, and the parity would be equal to one. So that's why your spin and parity of your nuclei is a nuclear system. Then next properties we have, there are different types of uh, dipole moment, that dipole moment, quadruple moment, and other electromagnetic moment, which arises in nuclear, uh, arises inside nuclear. And uh, the main idea of studying these moments is to see uh, to what extent the ch charge distortion is uh, present in a nuclear. So uh, before this, we discussed that the uh, density or uh, the mass density is almost constant throughout the nucleus. Uh, and the same would sort of apply to its charge density as well. But there are certain distortions in the nuclear structure. And to study this distortion, the easiest way would, would be to consider this different electromagnetic moments. So this uh, will start with the dipole moment here. Uh, dipole moment uh, arises from spin and spin of both protons and neutrons that we discussed before. But the direct relation as such between both these quantities, that is spin and dipole moment, is not known as such. But yeah, they both are. Uh, if, if if say the spin is zero, then you you are for sure going to have dipole moment and the other quadruple moment as such is zero. While if uh, the spin is non-zero, then you'll have some amount of non-zero dipole moment as well. Um, then, uh, uh, if we discuss uh, the moments, these magnetic moments of protons and neutrons themselves, uh, we think that neutron, because it is uh, because it has uh, zero charge in itself, it might not specific. It shouldn't be having a dipole moment or any other electromagnetic moment as such. But because neutron in itself consists of uh, three different th three types of quarks, and these quarks are the ones which will uh, quarks are the ones which will carry the charges, uh, and the distortion like the this quarks won't be evenly distributed inside the neutron itself. And because of this uneven dis uh, distribution, you'll have uh, uh, you'll have non-zero neutron magnetic moment. While proton magnetic moment, you can it's because of the distortions as well, as well as the non-negative, non-zero non charge of uh, protons, proton. Uh, now there are two uh, factors. One is this, what we call the gyromagnetic ratio. Gyromagnetic ratio, uh, the surface quantities are measured both from neutrons and protons. And 
paramagnetic ratio is directly related to this mu, which is uh, which gives you a magnetic moment in this case. So magnetic moment for uh, neutron is calculated to be just minus 1.91. Uh, there are a lot of experiments that goes for calculating to calculate the precision values. So it's precisely calculated, calculated to for the mode that it's over. While for proton we have uh, mu equal to 2.79, which is related to your g equal to minus 3.0. Then uh, yes. the next uh, moment is the quadruple moment that we do. Uh, this quadruple moment is uh, directly related to what the shape of your nucleus and the distortions in the shapes. So quadruple moment, uh, it's uh, given by this particular quantity. In classical mechanics, you have quadruple moment calculated by this row is the charge dis the distribution, charge distribution inside of nuclear. And into 3z squared, z is the z axis of it and r is the radii at that point into integrated with respect to the total volume this volume of the system while in quantum mechanics you have a more easier and more quantized to say quantized version of uh, quadruple moment calculation which is uh, given by this 3k square uh, minus and it's related to here you can see its relation to the spin as well which is uh, i is zero spin here and i into i plus one divided by the whole quantity there and Q0 is the total charge of your total charge of the nuclear. That would be just total number of protons in the system. So based on this quadruple moment, uh, if your quadruple moment is zero, which is the ideal case, you'll have a spherical nuclei again, the ideal spherical nuclei, but which is not the case for more. Yeah, I think your voice is not that clear. Is it better now? Yeah, it's it's better. Okay, thank you. Just let me know if it breaks again, okay? Yeah. So uh, based on this quadruple moment, uh, based on whether this quadruple moment is negative or positive or if it is very highly negative, you have three different shapes that are possible in nuclear. Prolate shape is the one where you will have your Q uh, greater than zero, while you have the nuclear will be in oblate shape if you have your Q less than zero. Uh, Triaxial shape is just again a distorted prolate system as far as I know. And again, you have Q less than zero in the triaxial system. So these are three different types of shapes that uh, your nuclei will usually assume. But there is a caveat here in the sense if there is a non-negative or there is a non-zero or octuple moment as well, then there are further distortions which are much more complex than uh, the simple shapes over here. Okay. Uh, the next property we'll discuss is the nuclear force, and Anushka has already discussed a lot about it before as well. But okay, the main idea of nuclear force is that uh, where it comes from is the, it's, it's, it's basically part of a residual color force. So in particle physics sections, you all must have done how color the um, gluons and the how different quarks interact with. Uh, through gluons and exchange of color, exchange of the color via gluons. Uh, the same thing happens in the nuclear interactions as well. A nuclear interactions in the sense that how will a uh, proton and nu neutron or a proton and proton or a neutron and neutron interact inside a nuclear. So their interaction is, uh, you can see in this particular, this black uh, picture over here, it's uh, via this, uh, uh, bosons called the mesons, and here is the pi meson. And uh, this pi meson, you'll have uh, your, uh, it's basically arising from your residual color force. So this pi meson will uh, consist of uh, two different, uh, two different uh, up quarks, which is up, up and entire up. And uh, the exchange of this meson between a proton and a neutron is the interaction that that is. Uh, that is basically consistent. That consists in it. So uh, this force is uh, regarding its properties. It just binds all the nucleons together. It's very short range. Uh, that is one femtometer. I think below about about below about if you go below zero zero point seven femtometer, 
nuclear force would be repulsive and would push away the nucleus, while between 1 to 2.5 femtometer is where it is most effective. Uh, yeah, so repulsive at intermuclear and distance is about 0 0.5 femtometer. It is mediated mainly by pions, which are given here. This pions are U and U, U, U dash. Um, it is not a central force in the sense that, uh, 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 like the way gravity is, it's not a radial force that is not dependent on R as such. The effect of nuclear force in one direction could be different from the effect of nuclear force in other direction at the same radius. Uh, and this happens because of a spin dependence. Uh, spin dependence in this area is that if the proton, the direction of proton spin doesn't really match, it doesn't match with the direction of neutron spin, that the force would be much lower compared to the case where the proton and neutron spin are along the same direction. Uh, and the final property it is because it is a color force, it's entirely dependent on just colors of the uh, color quantum numbers and it is independent of the charge of. Uh, charge of the system. So you'll have the uh, force between uh, proton and a neutron would be same as a force between proton and proton. So, uh, so what? Okay. So because of this uh, properties of nuclear, different properties of nuclear force, there is important fact, fact that arises, which is uh, the nuclear saturation. Nuclear saturation is uh, here again. We have in our nuclei, we both, you have both uh, protons and neutrons, and these protons would uh, repulse each other with the Coulombic interaction. So, at, while the strong nuclear force try to bind the protons together, together. So, what happens is that at some point, uh, the, uh, the the effect of both these forces uh, match to an extent that you have. Uh, saturation or that uh, if you even see in your binding energy curve over here, it, it saturates at this point sort of like, you know, there is a steep increase until it goes to 40. But after that, it either decreases or almost at the same level. This happens because of the saturation property over here, where uh, the Coulombic interaction uh, tends to be equivalent to, to the uh, strong force in this case. And the attractive and repulsive force cancel each other out in a way that uh, uh, in a way that how to say, in the way that uh, your binding energy curve is saturated at the point. So here you have your uh, diagram of uh, how the strong nuclear force behave and how the electrostatic force between uh, protons would behave. So at uh, here this, this, this point is somewhere around 0 0.5 and 2 meter where it starts repelling. Well, until about 2.4, it's the, uh, it has its maximum value between this. Uh, while the electrostatic force is, of course, very repulsive at short distances, but its strength also decreases as the separation increases. And at some point in between, you'll have the uh, stable nuclei where the nuclear, where the nuclear saturation has uh, arised, and both the Coulombic and the both the electromagnetic and strong force. Uh, Sustain in the nuclear atom. So, okay, moving on, we have uh, different. Okay, you all have then nuclear, nuclear, nuclear isotopes and isobars, and there are different uh, ways. Isotopes, I think, are ones where you have same number of protons than uh, the neutrons, therefore. While isobars are, I think, same number of okay, isobars are same mass numbers. And yeah, so based on that, we also have something called isomers. Isomers are basically uh, same states of uh, it's say it's a isomers are same nuclear but are different energies. So you'll have one ground energy and several excited states of one uh, nuclear one nuclear. So here you will, in the diagram you can see this is uh, uh, sodium uh, sodium nuclear which is decaying into magnesium magnesium via Beta, beta decay process where you can see that uh, the mass number remains the same while the atomic number is changed. So with this beta decay process, uh, it can decay to this one, two, three, five different states over here, where uh, five different states have different probabilities. Now, 
this probability is you can see that is if it's decaying to the magnesium 5.22 MeV energy state, we have probability of 0.09 percent. While the highest probability is taken by this particular state, 99 percent by 4.12. This probability is again dependent on uh, uh, the spin and parity so, uh, for the states and uh, of all the states, and based on that, it decays to the maximum probability of decaying to this particular state. So, uh, introducing the concept of isomers is basically to let you know that uh, all these decays goes into different states like this, and this uh, states are all of these states are again characterized by half lives. They have different decay modes and probabilities, different excitation energies, and spins and parities. You can see that uh, again that most of the higher energy states would end up at the point, uh, would end up decaying into lower, coming to the ground state or to first excited state. Uh, okay. uh, for the nuclear models, uh, we'll discuss two different models. One is the shell model and the uh, liquid drop model. Uh, most of the properties that we discussed before are uh, based on either of this model. I think most of them are mainly based on the shell model itself. Uh, the idea for considering both this model is yes, to explain this properties that we discussed. Then this model uh, explains the stability and then they tell you to tell you why only certain types of isotopes are possible or uh, why only certain types of uh, DK channels are uh, not probable and how the binding energies, reactions, all of this can be calculated based on this two different models. So we'll start with the liquid drug model. Uh, liquid drug model basically assumes, uh, assumes uh, uh, like uh, it's based on uh, how uh, water would be in SS, water would just uh, exist. So basically, you have uh, in, in, uh, when you have water, you know that water is. Uh, uh, the molecules are, uh, are binded together via hydrogen bonding, which is between hydrogen and the oxygen. While there is a repulsive force that comes due to the between uh, between the nuclei of both hydrogen oxygen and or oxygen oxygen, or the electron electron cloud. Uh, same and uh, what happens in the water is that it has constant density. The same factor is uh, observed in the uh, model of nuclear. While uh, uh, there is another of this that uh, if, if in water you try to push the molecules too close, you'll have repulsion. The same thing again comes in your nuclear. While if there are what molecules are too far, there is no attraction because hydrogen bonding in water is also dependent on distance, while our nuclear force and our electromagnetic repulsion both are also distance dependent. Then um, uh, so, what we assume in our liquid drop model is that it has uniform distribution of positive charge, and uh, this liquid drop, uh, based on different types of forces, it will change its shape. So, we start with our usual uh, uh, assumption of this that uh, R is equal to R0 into A raised to 1 by 3. This is uh, uh, R0 is about 5.2 nanometer and means it will be proportional to the one uh, square root of your uh, uh, atomic mass number. Uh, and the volume, you know, is proportional to the volume, which is proportional to the R is, is then proportional to the atomic number. So the uh, first idea from first thing we calculate from the liquid drop model is the semi empirical mass formula. Semi empirical mass formula is uh, an easy way to calculate uh, uh, to estimate the total binding energy of your system without having to do any nuclear, without having to observe a denuclear decay process or anything else. The binding energy of a nuclear is calculated using the semi empirical mass formula. So we start with assuming that uh, our binding energy is proportional to, uh, directly proportional to our body. So higher the volume, the higher binding energy. Higher the volume, it will have higher number of uh, atomic have higher number of protons and neutrons in it, and so the binding energy will be higher. And uh, it's directly proportional to the A with a proportionality factor given by this A and A B. So uh, to start with, the binding energy is equal to the uh, A B into A. And then apply various different correction factors, which are these are four different correction factors. 
So first collection of factors is uh, the surface. Surface storms come from the fact that uh, inside the volume, if you have, if you observe any nucleon inside the volume here, it is surrounded by nucleons all around it. But at the surface, you at the surface there is an edge where you know there is no nucleon beyond it. So this the force that is uh, force that is uh, uh, felt by the nucleons at the surface is different from whatever that is felt in, by nucleons inside it. And to account for this, we have a surface term, which is uh, which is subtracted again because yes, the force uh, outside is much less than the force felt by nucleons on the inside. And this is given by your surface term A raised to 2 by 3 because you know 4 pi r square, the surface is proportional to r square and there from there you have A raised to 2 by 2 factor and with the proportionality factor of proportionality constant of A s, that's your surface term. Uh, next, we consider the Coulombic interaction. Uh, Coulombic interaction because uh, when we first calculate the volume of uh, binding energy, it is assumed entirely based on the strong nuclear force, while the Coulomb force is not taken into consideration. But uh, due to Coulombic repulsion, to account for all the Coulombic <coughs> repulsion that would uh, uh, be there inside the nuclear, we have our Coulombic term, which is subtracted, which is and it's given by z into z minus one, which is the total number of protons interacting with each other, and divided by uh, r, which is uh, a raised to 1 by 3 is basically sort of uh, consists of, uh, it's basically about dividing with R, and your Coulombic term is, and the Coulombic uh, constant of proportionality is. Uh, then the next term is the asymmetry or symmetry term either way. So this, this happens because usually when, uh, uh, when the neutrons and protons fill up this uh, shells inside the nuclear, we try to do it in such a way that both there is a proton-proton pair and there is a neutron-neutron pair inside. And uh, what happens is that if you have a number of protons equal to the number of uh, neutrons, the symmetry term is considerably reduced. And since there is a if there is a symmetric distribution inside the nuclear, inside the nuclear, if both the number of neutrons and protons are equal. And to account for the symmetry term, we have this particular uh, quantity A into A, constant of proportionality into N minus Z squared divided by your total area A, A or this A. Uh, and then finally, we have to add one particular positive term, which is uh, due to pairing of uh, nuclear terms, and that, that if uh, this is a positive term because uh, it favors your binding energy. Favors your binding energy in the sense that if you have uh, uh, the number of uh, neutrons are uh, even, so when they pair up with each other, while well, the same will happen with the proton. Well, if there are odd number of neutrons, or odd number of protons, you'll have uh, that extra term, will have uh, one extra proton or neutron to account for, which is not paired with anyone else. And due to that, uh, it's dependent on this delta function that if it is uh, even number of protons or even number of neutrons, your delta delta term will be your delta will be plus one. While if it's not, then it will be minus one. And based on it, uh, will have its contribution to the binding measure. That's for liquid drop model. This model is successful in uh, explaining uh, radioactivity. Uh, specific coefficient, and then uh, in explaining the binding energies of most uh, nucleus. So the semi-empirical mass formula that you have uh, more or less calculates the binding energy of all nuclear to a very good approximation. Okay. Uh, next model is the shell model, which is uh, based on the atomic shell model itself, uh, based on atomic shell model where electrons fill up the uh, outer shells in an uh, atom. So here we have a uh, main idea of the shell model is the fact that it is based on Pauli exclusion principle and yes, it analogous to the electronic shell model. And uh, as in the electronic shell model, in, uh, this also you have uh, uh, different, different magic numbers and based on these magic numbers you will have uh, stability of your nucleus. So, uh, there are, but in, in the case of atom, atomic electronic shell model, you'll have just one shell where electrons fill up, 
well, inside the nuclei, you will you consider two different shells, which is one for protons and one for neutrons. And uh, um, pulling up of these shells is uh, based on uh, these different energy levels. So the first energy level is called the 1s level, while the second energy level, the 1p level. The third energy level consists of uh, two different uh, uh, two different uh, not shells as such, but sub shells so such as 1d and 2s. Uh, and uh, there are the small, uh, there are different shells like this, and you have your magic numbers which is 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, 20, 65, based on this. Uh, Okay, uh, and uh, say this different shells, uh, how we consider this uh, array, uh, the, poten the energy of this different shell is based on uh, the square well and the harmonic oscillator potential. I don't know what extent of QM introduction of them, but uh, the estimation of these energies is done using the square well and harmonic, uh, harmonic oscillator potential. So the shell model uh, increase the shell model uh, explains different types of properties, which is uh, uh, to be say that you know we when we saw these peaks in the uh, peaks in the binding energy over here, the peaks or the dips here. These peaks are dependent on the magic numbers of given by the shell model over here, and. Uh, And um, and then the, uh, both the spin and parity that we discussed before, both these properties are again calculated using the shell model itself, and finally the nuclear magnetic moment itself. Okay, uh, can I have? Okay. So we'll go on to discussing uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, nuclear fusion, uh, because the easiest uh, way to discuss it using considering the nuclear fusion in the sun. Nuclear fusion uh, 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 in the sun, uh, in sun starts with proton-proton uh, fusion. So proton-proton fusion, uh, you have your, your two protons that uh, uh, at, at a given uh, energy and the, uh, what do you say? Uh, at a certain energy level, they fuses to uh, form a deuteron here, deuteron system, which again interacts with uh, proton and deuteron, which again interact with uh, proton to form a helium-3 atom. And this helium-3, uh, there will be multiple processes that forms this helium-3 atom, and the two helium-3 atom forms your uh, helium-4 along with re, along with the release of two protons in the So this fusion is important in the sense that uh, the first mass deficit, that is, uh, if you consider uh, two protons and two neutrons, the mass of, uh, and calculate the total mass of it, and then you calculate the mass of a uh, binder system of helium-4. There is a mass deficit, which is 0.7% of the total mass of helium. And the 0.7% is uh, mass deficit arises from the binding energy that is released. And even though this uh, percentage seems very, very less, the number of uh, hydrogen atoms available inside the sun is so high that uh, at any, any second you have about 3.8 into 10 raised to 26 joules of energy released just due to the, uh, just from this fusion process in the sun's core. So uh, the, uh, there are two different uh, uh, factors involved in this uh, fusion process. One is uh, one is that your proton should have a uh, considerable amount of energy to uh, to to to, uh, to get close to the to get close to another proton over here or to start the fusion process as such. Uh, and this energy or you know the velocity of the proton is uh, because inside the sun's core, we consider it as an ideal gas system. It is given by Maxwell, Bo Max Maxwell Boltzmann's distribution, and it's proportional to this uh, energy min exponential of minus e upon 20. While uh, the other factor involved is the fact that two protons cannot really get too close to each other because of the Columbic repulsion. But if they do have to do it, they have to do it at a really, really, uh, really, really fast speed. 
and uh, here the, the telonym to columbic barrier is involved in the sense if the two photons are moving at uh, uh, really high speed they can they can cross the, they don't have to go and cross the barrier that is involved rather if you if you are considering this as the barrier that the protons have to cross uh, instead of crossing this barrier they just tunnel through the system so this is uh, the QM concept involved with the tunnel, tunneling to Columbic barrier system, and based on this two different uh, two different factors, we can consider the, we calculate the relative probability of fusion occurring inside the cell, and see Maxwell distribution, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution peaks at some point, while the Columbic barrier uh, goes on increases, it goes on increasing with uh, increase in the energy of the system here. And at some point where uh, both of this uh, graph intersect each other, we have the gamma peak. The gamma peak is the maximum probability that you can have for a fusion process inside uh, or, or any fusion process in general. So uh, uh, next, uh, I will discuss the alpha decay process. Uh, Alpha decay process uh, happens mainly in heavy nuclei. Uh, here we have one example of the radium nuclei with atomic uh, atomic number of ATK. So uh, once uh, this alpha decay process, uh, uh, the reason for uh, this radioactive decay is the fact that most of this heavy heavy nuclei are unstable or they have an uh, unsuitable neutron proton ratio, and this ratio is either uh, Way higher, it's mainly way higher than the uh, stability curve, stability uh, line of your neutron proton ratio that we consider. And to move towards this stability, uh, this uh, heavy uh, heavy nucleons release an alpha particle. This happens in uh, the process uh, quantum mechanically. It considers as such that uh, the alpha particle is uh, uh, known the uh, known to exist within a uh, nucleus uh, in the sense that uh, you'll have a wave function of your nuclei and within this wave function you'll have a trapped alpha nuclei and this trapped alpha nuclei uh, now has to again tunnel through the columbic barrier because again your nuclei is uh, positively charged same as your alpha particle and uh, because of uh, because of this finite probability it has to tunnel through this columbic barrier and um, in most of the processes, because of the binding energy instability, this process is favorable in the high mass nuclei. And uh, you have your alpha decay process. Here, one example where you have your radium decaying into, um, uh, I, I'm not sure what RNA exactly says, but RN86 and then helium, uh, helium nuclei along with uh, a release of energy, 3.78 MeV of energy. So uh, next uh, the process we have uh, is the nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is uh, uh, an, like fusion is the where you combine two different nucleus to form, form something, form a higher uh, nuclear. But in nuclear fusion, uh, your higher nuclear splits into two or more small nuclei. And uh, this nucleus are almost when they split, it's uh, almost of a similar size. So, uh, this process is different from your alpha decay of proton. Can we wait for a couple of minutes then? Because I can't do anything about it. Yes, I'm in my mom's office because my network at home is really bad. So I can't do anything about background noise. Okay, is it better now? Yeah, it's it's better. Okay. So, uh, so most of the nuclear fission process have to be induced. Uh, they are very uh, uh, in case only in case of instable uh, unstable nuclei is the process spontaneous, but is something that can be induced as well, such as uh, using shooting of neutrons. This is usually what happens in your nuclear reactors, where you have one heavy element of this uh, uranium or lead. You shoot shoot neutral neutral neutrons at it, 
and this neutrons induces uh, induces the fission process and fission process in itself releases energy that can be uh, releases binding energy that can be utilized so uh, uh, the process is quite simple it just requires some amount of initial energy so that it can overcome this nuclear force and deform the nuclear so you have your uh, consider a ideal spherical nuclei you shoot some particle at it this particle will deform the nuclei in a shape such that uh, there is more instability introduced in this nuclear and because of this instability uh, instability uh, the elect the electromagnetic forces will take over or take over the nuclear forces and the nuclei will uh, split apart at some split apart at a uh, split apart into two different uh, nuclei so this is how uh, in most of the nuclear reactors your uh, uh, nuclear fission process occurs the neutron is uh, thrown at an uranium p3 pipe and this which splits into two different lighter elements along with the release of neutrons and energy and this energy is what we uh, utilize from the nuclear reactors so uh, that's just a main for you Uh, yes, this is the end of your nuclear physics section. Physics session. I think we'll take a five-minute break after this. And uh, okay, so we have uh, two different sessions planned. I'm not sure we're going to finish it in forty minutes. Uh, one is the uh, one is on particle uh, physics facilities, and other ses uh, session is on neutrino physics. So, do you all have any preference for either of the session, or do you all want me to try to squeeze in both the sessions? Okay, I'll
uh, hello guys we are taking a uh, break we'll continue our session at 12:15 Okay, guys, so let's start with the part of the presentation. So, I'm going to Okay, guys, there's no screen being shared. I'm really not sure how teams work here. Yeah. Screen is not visible. Okay, um, it's not allowing me to share this. Yeah, now it is visible. Now it is shared.
I think your voice is not coming. Yeah, now it's audible. Okay, did you hear me from the beginning or did it cut off from half We couldn't hear you from the beginning. Okay, so I'll start all over. Uh, so, in this section, we'll uh, just discuss different types of particle experiment, particle physics experiment, and what uh, uh, current day experiments are, what current day, uh, current day accelerators, and everything that we have, and what kind of research is being carried out at this facility. So, uh, to start with, of uh, course, our biggest facility is uh, the CERN, which is located in Geneva. And CERN has its uh, primary or uh, the largest uh, collider, which is the Large Hadron Collider, and different experiment based at the Large Hadron Collider. But before LHC started, we had different uh, Hadron Colliders again uh, going back 50 to 60 years. We had something called the intersecting storage rings. Intersecting storage ring was considerably lower size collider, but yes, uh, it is something that. Uh, uh, set up the uh, set of uh, this uh, era of hydron collider. Apart from that, we have a facility called anti proton decelerator, which decelerates your anti matter ions for their studies. Uh, we are going to come up with something called uh, high luminosity LHC. Uh, this, all this are external, while there are other big facilities which is Devatron, which was hosted by Formula, I think. There is a relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookenhaven National Lab, or something called Devatron uh, to the years ago, I think. Then we'll also discuss other facilities such as HERA and uh, Electron Ion Collider ASC, where SLAC is the Stanford Linear Accelerator Collider. So, I'll start with understanding how a simple synchrotron or simple collider is, is to say, works. Uh, there's nothing much about it, to be honest. It's just uh, you know, for a simple uh, a synchrotron, we'll have a uh, it starts its process from an injector or a pre accelerator. This pre accelerator is again a synchrotron, you see. So, this injector uh, will inject a beam of your. Uh, proton ions, uh, your lead ions, gold ions, whichever ions you wish to collide inside a synchrotron. And once this injects, you have your uh, injector kicker, will, uh, which will try to accelerate these ions to higher energies or whatever uh, energies that is uh, defined in the synchrotron. Now, once you once you get inside, you have different uh, injector acceleration gaps. Here, it's uh, just a simple synchrotron model, but you have uh, multiple curves and multiple acceleration gaps in uh, uh, something like LHC, and uh, which goes on accelerating your beams to higher and higher energies. Uh, now, in the synchrotron, you have different magnets, which uh, forms such important aspects. So, one, is, uh, one are the dipole magnets. This dipole magnets help in bend bending your beam. So, at every curve, at every stage, you have dipole magnets located, and because your uh, beam is ionized, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's an ionized beam of protons and lead ions. This dipole, dipole the magnetic field bends this, uh, bends the field. it bends this beam into uh, inside the accelerator center. Uh, when during the bending process, the beam has tendency to get defocused, and this refocusing is done using quadruple magnets. While uh, once the refocusing is done, you go on to uh, there is not just uh, one uh, synchrotron here, you usually have a pair of synchrotron. Pair of synchrotron will meet at some point and PNC travel in opposite direction and collide at a point. And at this collision point, you set up your detector or your physics experiment, and this detector uh, detects the energies of particles, their momentum ranges, or uh, the different types of particles, whatever. It's based on your different detector. detector uh, types you have uh, different experiments based on. 
Yeah, and finally, you also have something in the expression taker. This expression taker either uh, sends the beam to higher accelerator or a different accelerator, or it's a beam dump where you throw away your beam and basically, uh, 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 basically give, throw it out of the sink. You know. So here's your LHC complex. LHC com it's a vast complex. Uh, uh, to start with uh, here, we can start with line two or line three, which is the linear accelerator, which initially accelerates your beam. Now this line two goes to something called the booster. Booster further accelerates. From booster they travel to proton synchrotron, mostly again further acceleration. And for proton synchrotron, they travel to superproton synchrotron. There are different experiments set at SPS itself, which uh, which works at that uh, SPS energy is a low energy. But from superproton synchrotron, you finally move them to our main ring, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Now, Large Hadron Collider has uh, four different, uh, four main experiments. One is the CMS, Compact Muon Seminar. There is Alice, Atlas, and LHCB. And uh, both this, uh, uh, this experiments are that and detectors say this and collision collision points are located at each of these experiments and at each of the collision points to collect the data from the detector and the further physics analysis from it. Now there are other facilities which is the entire proton decelerator with along with Elena with these two or decelerators which uh, trap your uh, entire matter for further studies. There is Isolde facility, which is a nuclear physics facility. We'll discuss more about it again. Uh, I think instead of this, you are, uh, Anushka, you can um, share your screen and show the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just. Can you see my screen? See my screen. Ah, uh, yes. It's not audible for some reason. Mm -hmm. Is it audible now? So today is a special day. Yeah. It's uh, It's audible. It was audible, but uh, now I can't hear it again. Yeah, did you say anything? Uh, yeah, it was audible before, but now I can't hear anything. I'm not sure if others can hear. Okay. Like, uh, can you hear? Okay, just down for the LHC. 
not only the LHC, but also the experiments in the LHC and the. Is it uh, like, can you hear now? Uh, we can hear. Uh, I can hear it. It's here. It's a chain for the LHC. Uh, the long shutdown was used to upgrade the machine, to upgrade the injectors, to create more bright beams uh, in order for the number of collisions in the LHC to increase. The exp experiments have also upgraded and to be able to detect all these uh, collisions, of course. And today, actually, the beam turned for the very first time again in the LHC at injection level, so not yet accelerating injection and uh, the very first things we're going to do is with this beam check out if all the instruments and all the equipment in the LHC is working as it should. Everything has to work at the same time like an orchestra uh, where all the music has to play synchronously for it to be beautiful and that's the same in the LHC. For it to work everything has to work at the right moment at the right time. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put some obstructions in the beam line where we hit the particles on this obstruction. This will create a shower of secondary particles, and this can already be detected by the detectors. So the, the detectors will light up and the experimentalist can see if the detectors work uh, in all the channels. And then in the coming periods, we will increase the energy of the beam to the world record of 6.8 tera electron volts and then put the beams in collision and this will happen in July when the real physics will start again. So, yeah, it was about uh, let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now it's visible. Yeah, I think your voice is not coming. Your voice is not coming. Guys, can you hear me now? Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay, so what I was saying is that uh, LSC has, as, uh, as you saw in the video, there are different um, shutdowns and the uh, runtime that it has. One, there were, I think it has completed two runs, and the next run, the th run three, is going to happen within the next couple of months, or now in July if they are on schedule. But in between, there are long shutdowns, and during the shutdowns, you either uh, upgrade, uh, either repair different parts of your accelerators or upgrade your detectors so that they can handle 
uh, higher radiations and higher amount, higher number of particles that are thrown at this uh, detectors over here. So uh, that's how usually your uh, LHC schedule as such works. Uh, apart from that, okay, the more about working, so LHC will have you. So at LHC, there are mainly three types of collisions that are conducted, main, mainly. So one is the proton-proton collisions, and this happens at energies of about uh, 5 TV, then there is 7 TV reaction, 7 TV collisions, and finally at about 13.5 or approximately 13 only. Uh, the other one are the lead lead collisions at 2.7 and 5 TeV. And in between, you also collide proton with uh, lead, there is proton lead collisions at somewhere about 8 TeV. Okay. So, uh, as I said, there are four different types of main instruments, which is CMS, LS, ATLAS, and LHCD. CMS and uh, ATLAS are uh, like general purpose detectors. So, you have uh, they can hand they can handle all three collisions that is proton 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 lead and lead lead as well. While Ellis is mainly for heavy ion collisions, so it will only uh, uh, go for uh, lead lead collisions here. Well, LHCB is a dedicated experiment again for uh, measurements and physics related to study of this beauty quark. So it is large hadron collider at beauty quark to say. So a beauty on the bottom quark. And uh, all its studies are dedicated to uh, beauty quark as well. Now, there are other experiments where CM has, CMS has a totem experiment which looks into uh, dark matter studies. There is LHCB forward experiment which is uh, related to jet physics and the forward physics that arises in this uh, collision. Ex collisions. Uh, okay. So the acceleration facility itself works with uh, uh, the same works mainly works on this very simple formula, which is your uh, Lorentz force formula. Force is equal to E plus uh, B plus B. So your acceleration process is uh, entirely dependent on your electric field. So inside this synchrotron in LHC as well as the pre-accelerators that are involved. You have your electric field that accelerates all this, all your proton ions and the lead ions. While there is, ma while the magnetic field, because it is moving in a circular direction, it is involved in changing the direction. These are the dipole magnets mainly that we discussed before. So these are the, di the dipole magnets which helps in bending or uh, changing the direction of your beam part beam. And finally, the quadrupole magnets which are involved in focusing your beam and keeping it intact so that at the collision happens at maximum maximum possible cross section. Okay, so okay, so there are uh, LHC has different goals based on its different instruments, which is search for new particles uh, uh, at higher energies or at which are which are very rare interactions or low interaction rates. Uh, for this, you need really, really large data sets, and that's why we are also go that's why LHC is also going for run three, which is going to increase the number of data sets involved. Uh, Higgs physics, since uh, you would have known since uh, 2012 when Higgs particle was di uh, uh, discovered, it was discovered by uh, uh, detectors from these two main experiments, CMS and AT ATLAS, uh, combining results from or the data sets from both these uh, detectors. Uh, uh, Higgs, Higgs boson was discovered at LHC. So currently, uh, all the runs are dedicated and uh, studying further properties of Higgs boson. Uh, more than that, uh, there are standard model, the standard uh, model and beyond standard model measurements carried out by this experiment. There are QCD studies, quantum chromodynamics, and uh, uh, additionally, there is a uh, quark one plasma formation. This is specifically something that happens in your uh, Light light collision because proton proton collision doesn't have that high of density to or uh, that high energy to uh, for needed for formation of quark gluon plasma. Uh, so, mainly Alice and CMS are the two experiments involved in studies of QGP formation. Uh, LSC was one of, I think it was the second facility to first uh, detect this uh, state of matter. Before that, it was uh, the uh, relativistic heavy ion collider situated in Brookenhaven National Lab that first discovered QGP. And after that, both the laboratories have further carried out these studies. 
Uh, now the then again, there are specific experiments for supersymmetry, dark matter, and flavor physics. So LSE has this wide range of uh, wide range of uh, research and theory testing and modeling that goes on based on these experiments. Okay. Yes. So the four main experiments, as we said, uh, and uh, uh, I'll show you one general purpose detector. This is the CMS detector. Uh, CMS detector uh, here. It, uh, all four detectors are more or less similar, except for one particular. They will have one particular different factor in it dedicated to a particular study. Uh, but CMS detector here, it consists of uh, in most inside is the tracker or uh, silicon tracker and pixel detector. This tracker uh, detects your uh, tracks of your particle, and based on its deviation or its momentum and measurements of its mass. The particle identity or what kind of particle it is is uh, determined using this tracker system. So uh, after the tracker, you have electromagnetic calorimeter, which uh, uh, which uh, measures the amount of energy, uh, EM energy, or the number of photons that hits this electromagnetic uh, this uh, ECAL calorimeter. And after that, you have hadron calorimeter, which measures the energy of uh, hadronic particles sitting. Uh, and beyond the hadron calorimeter, you have something called a zero degree calorimeter, which will, uh, which is situated at these edges. It's not a covering entire detector, but it is situated at the edges and uh, detects the remaining number of particle. And after the ZDC, you have a big muon chamber. And muon chamber, that's how, that's where CMS gets its name of compact muon selenide. So there's a muon chamber. And beyond the muon chamber, or somewhere in between, you have a big four Tesla magnet. Tesla magnet, which is uh, involved, which helps the tracker in bending the tracks of your particles, momentum tracks of the particles, and uh, uh, determining their identity. So you have tracker, EM calorimeter, hadronic calorimeter, HF is the hadronic forward calorimeter, which is uh, located at the edges over here, and beyond that, you have the zero degree calorimeter. This is how most of the particle physics detectors sort of look like. So, okay, uh, we'll talk a bit about intersecting storage ring. Intersecting storage ring because it was the first hadron collider ever to be made, uh, ever to be made, not just at CERN, but uh, in the world. So, ISR uh, was based on uh, three main concepts that uh, run any kind of accelerator. One is the stochastic cooling. So, when you uh, put your beams together, your proton and lead beams together, um, they interact at such a high energies that you, uh, or that, that they tend to spread out. So to make the beam, to keep the beam focused, apart from the quadruple magnets that we discussed, you need some cooling process in it, which is the stochastic cooling process that uh, before the even before the acceleration happens, you get your beams together using the stochastic cooling process. There is RF stacking, radio frequency stacking, where uh, uh, you now you know you not just need one single beam. You need bunch of uh, protons to be together so that you have your collision has a very high impact or very high probability of one proton hitting another proton. So you stack a different uh, you stack protons together using this RF tracking RF stacking method. And another idea was the usage of magnetic detectors in this because uh, without magnetic detectors you cannot really track the uh, you cannot really trace the tracks of this particle. So these two three main things that are legacy of ISR and have been uh, and are still being used in almost all the accelerators. And uh, apart from that, the results from this ISR included it discovered the J and epsilon meson for the first time. Uh, then uh, there were different aspects of proton structure that was uh, uh, researched by ISR facilities. And finally, about QCD and uh, box. So, uh, what lies ahead is the fact that uh, if you look at this interaction strength and the energy scale diagram, currently we currently currently we are at the scale where we can detect we are sort of low energies over here, and we can only detect processes which have really high interaction strength. Uh, the low interaction strength and the low energy scale processes are studied by the fixed uh, target facilities where you have one fixed target and the beam will collide against it. These are called the intensity frontiers because uh, 
you because they are happening at uh, happening at low interaction st strength and that's why you need very high intensity of your particle being here there's a sort of unknown physics over here uh, or being studied kind of physics while at higher energy scale and higher interaction strength we do we can go up to higher we can the high interaction strength uh, these are not the rare processes so we can detect them easily but to but to completely understand them you need really high energy scale which are given by lhc and uh, future hadron colliders over here but the unknown physics lies at this low interaction strength and low energy so uh, the uh, goals of most of the hadron colliders at this point is to uh, increase their energies and uh, probe this unknown physics regions here. so the future of lhc is yes to increase this energy scale and probe the unknown physics so we have uh, the high luminosity lhc or hl lhc coming up in 2020 it's currently in uh, in the in its construction phase uh, so this facility will increase the number of collision per second that happens so at lhc you have in one uh, one one proton bunch or like one in a beam when you work a bunch of protons will collide. It will be about, say, 120 protons that collide. But uh, this uh, interaction strength, interaction rate in uh, a case of high luminosity LHC will be increased to at least twice or thrice that of the current rate. And this uh, will hopefully help in observing the rare processes that uh, rare processes that happens at uh, or processes with very low probability. High luminosity LHC also plans to take much larger uh, data sets, that is, uh, to uh, increase uh, drastically increase the number of collision runs that can happen and increase these data sets because in observing rare processes, you need both higher number of collisions as well as larger data sets. Uh, but beyond HL LHC, uh, Sun doesn't stop there. You have there are plans that goes uh, again up till 2060, 2080, I think. So future, there is something called the Future Circular Collider Project, which is currently in its uh, designing and feasibility testing stage. But beyond, after the high luminosity LHC runs are uh, runs are then, uh, Sun is probably going to start with uh, construction of Future Circular Collider. So you can see here a uh, large hadron collider, which is here. Large LHC is a uh, uh, its circumference here is 27 kilometer while the planned uh, future circular collider is supposed to be uh, 100 to 80 to 100 kilometer long time over here. So if, if uh, future circular collider will uh, start with collisions of electron-electron collision, this electron-electron collisions are uh, um, helpful in understanding particle generation as such. So formation, uh, this uh, electron positive, when you have electron positron annihilation process and the release of really high energy, you will have particle pair creation. So, uh, the study of new par new particles that can be formed at really high energies is uh, one of the goals of future circular collider. Moving on from there, they are going to introduce uh, uh, electron hydron collision, that is, electron proton collision or electron and light collision, to say, and finally move on to hydron hydron collisions at the end. Uh, I think the hadron hadron collision, the goal to do this is only somewhere around 2080s or 2090s, and all of this is just currently in prototyping or, or designing phase. Uh, so, uh, also, another fact is that currently our energies only go up to 14 TV, that is, proton proton collisions at 14 TV, I would say. But uh, for future circular collider, the planned energy will go about 100 TV for. Uh, hadron hadron collision while it will go to about 350 TV for electron electron collisions. Uh, there's something interesting that you can go later and read. I, I'll send the link of this on uh, Teams as well. It is uh, It was one of the paper uh, published about uh, constructing a heavy uh, high energy hadron collider on moon and it is actually a very very proper study done. So, if you want, you can. It's, it's simple to understand itself, so you can go and read uh, read this paper. Both of uh, I think uh, the authors, uh, both are the 
renowned uh, physics accelerator physicist that we know, uh, Zimmerman, Frank Zimmerman is based at CERN, and James is based at Duke University, James B. Ken is based at Duke University. So you can go read this paper for uh, uh, looking around what uh, what kind of uh, foundational studies are involved in uh, construction of hadron colliders. Constructing on constructing on moon is a perfect idea, not something that they actually plan on doing right now. But this was an interesting study that they carried out. Okay, so uh, another fact is that uh, now we saw that LHC is going from uh, the novel LHC to increasing the size of this collider, so 27 kilometer tunnel. They are moving it up to 100 kilometers. But what happens is that what if we are not able to detect anything at anything at 100 uh, kilometer tunnel or that high energy sets well? Because going beyond and increasing the sizes of tunnel is not the only thing that we only thing that uh, that can help increase the energy. So what they wanted to find out is uh, what they want to understand or. Uh, uh, design is something that you can have a small accelerator and still accelerate your proton or your lead beams to really high energies. So moving on from your conventional accelerators that I use, and because this accelerator, this they will also break down at this particular electric field because uh, uh, the vacuum uh, because of the vacuum ionization processes uh, at 10 uh, 10 megavolt per meter of uh, electric field your uh, uh, yes, uh, your yeah. vacuum starts to break down at this point. So you have uh, instead of, uh, so better idealize and get something more in the field. And one idea is to get this plasma wave field accelerator. Plasma wave field accelerator. There is a facility at CERN which is called this Awake Experiment, which is currently using a uh, plasma acceleration process. So. Uh, so how this is carried out is that uh, this ex accelerating plasma, like they basically have uh, plasma, uh, the plasma medium, which is your ionized electrons and protons or ionized uh, uh, state of matter. And in this ionized state of matter, you generate waves or waves or what they particularly call the wake field. And this wake field are uh, involved in accelerating your proton or the electron beams to uh, high energies. Okay. Uh, as of now, they have succeeded in accelerating their proton, their electron beams to this uh, GV scale. But if, if they are able to go to the TV scale, that is tetra tetra electron volt scale, it will be almost comparable to the experiment to the energy scales of uh, large electron collider. Okay. Um, there are more accelerators that are <coughs> coming up apart from your know, future circular collider and your high luminosity LHC. One is this electron ion collider. So before electron ion collider, uh, there was an experiment called the HERA experiment located in Germany. Uh, at this experiment, uh, this experiment studied the proton structure, spin structure of proton and different sort of QCD and the strong force related st uh, <coughs> uh, states at it. But uh, what was required is that uh, this this was only happening at the GV scale. But uh, so uh, so the Brookenhaven National Labs, along with Formula, decided to uh, move, decided to design an experiment called the electron ion collider, where they are going to use the polarized ion electron beam to shoot at a beam of uh, protons. And the goals of this experiment involve studies of internal structure of proton. So there are various questions such as you know, uh, such as uh, how the spin of the proton arises because uh, or how the distortions in the spin happen or uh, uh, how how uh, how the how quarks and gluons inside protons inside protons interact. Since there are uh, if you say what when we say there are only three quarks inside protons, it's the, what, what is uh, what is said is that there are three valence quarks inside the proton. Instead of that, you have, apart from the three valence quarks, valence quarks you have multiple quark anti quark pairs or gluon anti gluon pairs which are involved in gluon pairs which are involved uh, in the interaction inside protons and which gives rise to uh, gives rise to the uh, spin structure different uh, gives rise to spin structure of the proton. 
So the electron man collider is one experiment that is going to probe all of uh, this QCD phenomena involving strong force and how the mass of proton arises and again related to <coughs> quark one plasma and its quark one confinement concepts. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this experiment is currently and I think in its uh, construction phase, so it will start taking data somewhere around the end of Okay. Um, Finally, we'll go to the antimatter factory. This antimatter factory is based on the antiproton decelerator axon. This antiproton decelerator, um, it's a ring that uh, takes an antiproton beam, antiproton project. There's a tar target beam here, and it generates antiproton. It takes it inside a decelerator and decelerates it to the energy so that different experiments, such as uh, different experiments that are set up there can uh, start take these protons and study them, uh, study the properties of antimatter. So you have the, uh, the main force of this antiproton decelerator is catching and storing this antimatter. Then they carry out measurements on this antiproton, the measurements such as measuring their uh, uh, simple things such as measuring their mass or their charge to mass ratio because uh, in, because we want this mass or the charge to mass ratio of anti protons to be equal to the protons. Otherwise, that is, otherwise you know that there is matter antimatter symmetry that can be attributed to attributed to this phenomenon. So uh, different experiments are carried out in this sense. I don't have to this in the This is one question for you to take. Just guess the answer for us. How much antimatter has been produced at Sony as of now, approximately? Okay. You can turn on your mic and answer if you want to or wipe it out. So I think for it, I'll get the answer later. If you have any guesses. Okay. You can uh, write, write in the chat. It's okay. I don't think I can open the chat right now. I'll do the okay, screen share. Okay, so uh, we discussed the goals of antiproton decelerator actually. Uh, there was one experiment in particular which was antiprotons using use of antiprotons in a medical field. This was the ACE experiment in all. And uh, it suggested that in the cancer therapy where you use uh, one of the cancer therapy, there is a use of protons, but they suggested that if you use anti-protons, you will need to use as much as less than uh, less than four times the radiation and it will be involved in this process. And I think they are about to get their clinical uh, permission also to use anti-protons now instead of protons in this uh, uh, proton therapy involved in cancer. Uh, yes, and uh, finally, the final facility at CERN is the uh, nuclear physics facility called the Isotope Mass Separator Online Facility. Uh, this facility uses <coughs> low energy radioactive beams, and uh, this uh, radioactive beams uh, uh, generates these radio different kinds of radioactive nucleus beam and decelerates them for further studies. This radioactive nuclear beams are generated using this 1.4 TV protons and when they are thrown on different targets. So when you use these protons and throw them on different types of isotopes, different types of radio nucleides are formed over here. And using this, they study processes such as fusion, spallation, and fragmentation, which can be used in nuclear reactors or energy generation. Um, as of now, Isolde has studied about 1300 isotopes of 70 elements and uh, all the application are used in, they are applied in the various medical application, nuclear physics, uh, radio nucleus and uh, the studies related to standard model itself and finally in the study of nuclear or uh, radioactive isotopes. Okay, I think that's the end of uh, session, but I'll ask Kanishka to show you that one video on plasma acceleration. It's there, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
If I say particle accelerator, is the voice coming? Oh, yes, it is. Here, this is what you picture, right? Dozens of kilometers worth of tunnels, electromagnetic plates and coils, vacuum lines, and delicate hardware. For most of the history of particle physics, the motto has always been, well, I guess we need a bigger particle accelerator. And up until recently, that's been a very successful, albeit expensive, solution. RHC is the world's most powerful accelerator, and at 27 kilometers in diameter, it's easily the largest machine on Earth. Designed by a team of 10,000 scientists and at a cost of $7.5 billion, it's a very expensive toy. But it paid off. One of the main goals of the project, which was to discover the Higgs boson and prove the existence of the Higgs field, happened very shortly after the accelerator came online and was followed by a Nobel Prize for the discovery in 2013. With all that money in size, the maximum the LHC will ever be able to accelerate particles to is about 8 to 10 tera electron volts. This is frankly, an astonishingly large amount of power, and yet to truly explore the depths of the universe, it's several orders of magnitude too small, apparently. Even at those high energies, we're barely seeing new particles pop out, which has scientists confused. So now the motto is beginning to change. Rather than build bigger accelerators, scientists are trying to build better, smaller ones, or use old ones in new ways. <laughs> Sorry for the interruptions. One of my favorite up and coming designs is something called a Wakefield accelerator. These seem weird when you first start learning about them, but are actually very clever. Before we can dive into that, let's take a quick look at how a standard particle accelerator works. Fundamentally, most particle accelerators work by sequentially pulling particles toward electrodes in a sequence. Imagine a long line of metal rings in a vacuum with a single electron placed at one end. When you put some positive voltage on the first ring, the electron is attracted to it. Before the electron makes it to the ring, turn the voltage off. Already, the electron is now moving pretty quickly forward. As it passes the first ring, put voltage on the second ring. As before, turn off the voltage before the electron reaches it. Of course, you'll need to turn on each ring faster and faster, but so long as you keep doing that, the electron will continue to be pulled faster and faster as it's pulled towards the next rings. Most of the time, this is done using things like radio frequency oscillation. Radio waves oscillate between positive and negative voltage up to several billion times per second, so applying something like that to the rings allows you to turn them on and off very quickly. Particles that are put in the path will get accelerated pretty quickly up to a decent fraction of the speed of light and with energies measured in millions of volts or more. The main issue is that all of this takes a lot of distance to get things up to really high speeds and energies. So physicists build accelerators in rings so that the particles can go through a bunch of times and slowly build up that energy. However, to make that possible, they also need to add magnets to make the particles curve around the path of the accelerator. This comes with the problem that now every time the accelerating particles interact with a magnetic field and curve their trajectory, they also lose energy as something called cyclotron radiation. Basically, they release photons every time it happens, and those photons carry away some of the energy. To combat these losses, physicists just make the accelerators bigger and bigger and bigger. So what makes a Wakefield accelerator better? Well, the main thing is that they can accelerate particles a lot in the span of a couple of meters, whereas a traditional accelerator would require kilometers for the same amount of acceleration. If Wakefield accelerators are so much more efficient, why aren't they the standard that everyone uses? Well, currently you need a decent-sized regular accelerator or an aggressively powerful laser to run them. To understand why, let's jump in and see how they work. Fundamentally, all a Wakefield accelerator is, is a long tube filled with a metallic gas, usually something like lithium vapor. There are two ways to actually turn this into an accelerator, which, as I mentioned, are really big laser and smaller particle accelerator. Let's look at the lasers first. For your driving laser, you need one that can deliver a pulse that's very short but very powerful, kind of like a light bullet. When you fire that into the plasma cell, the name of the tube full of vapor, the light has so much energy that it causes the gas to ionize and become plasma. More importantly, the pulse leaves a wake behind it as electrons and ions get pushed around by the sudden burst of electromagnetic energy. Think of it like the wake of a boat where the path behind the boat is choppy with lots of little peaks and troughs in the water. In this case, rather than rough water, some areas are very positive and some are very negative. 
You may notice that those oscillations look similar to the pattern of charges in a normal particle accelerator. The trick is to fire the thing you want to accelerate through the tube but just behind the light pulse. If we use a bunch of electrons as our thing to be accelerated, the area just behind the light pulse ends up very positive, so the electrons are constantly being pulled towards it. This accelerates the electron bunch to a good fraction of the speed of light very quickly as the electrons chase the light pulse. The thing that really makes this process work is that the laser pulse loses energy to the wake, which is then transferred to the electrons. However, as you can imagine, timing is critical. If the pulses are too close or too far apart, this doesn't work properly and things don't accelerate. This whole process, when it does work, is what's called self-focusing. The trailing bunch of electrons actually get packed together into a dense little packet as they're accelerated, which is extra useful. Using a particle accelerator to drive these is similar, but instead of using high-powered lasers, they just send two bunches of particles, one behind the other. Thanks to the energy handoff that the wake field makes possible, you can give all of the energy of the first bunch to the trailing bunch, giving it a huge speed boost. So how much kick do these things really have? As of now, groups have been able to accelerate particles 9 giga electron volts higher in only 1.2 meters worth of wake field, such as in the FACET-1 facility. For comparison, most LINAX don't do that in a kilometer. And that was only 30% energy transfer from the accelerating bunch to the trailing bunch. They're building a new facility that should be able to transfer up to 80% of the energy in only a single meter of accelerator. And for me, that's why Wakefield accelerators are so exciting. On their own, they can do a lot and will maybe replace the other accelerator types in the years to come. But even now, as little add-ons to current accelerators, they can boost the energy significantly without taking up much space at all. Everyone is kind of getting on the Wakefield train now, too. CERN and many other national accelerator facilities around the world are all starting to work on their own Wakefield projects. But I think the thing I find the most interesting about all of this is that it might be happening in space. Yeah, you heard me right, space accelerators. Let me explain. When a star blows up in a supernova, it goes without saying that there's some pretty impressive pressure waves emanating from that explosion. We don't usually think about it, but there's also extremely intense magnetic fields present as well. The interaction of the magnetic fields and the plasma is called magnetohydrodynamics. As the fields and plasma interact, they, they're both bent and shifted around. The fields develop these little wiggles called alphavan waves, which are how they release some of that tension. You also have areas where the plasma is very dense and areas where it's less dense. In all that turbidity, you end up with areas that behave just like a wake field accelerator. These sorts of waves and systems are everywhere too. Even streams of particles coming off of the sun are boosted a bit by the alpha waves in the sun's magnetic field. It's part of the reason why the corona of the sun is so unusually hot. Everything is getting a little extra boost, cranking the temperature way up. And if that's possible with the fields from just our sun, imagine what the waves coming off something like a black hole merger would do. Either way, the result would be extremely high energy cosmic rays, especially ones made of elements that shouldn't otherwise be moving so quickly. As it happens, we do detect a large amount of cosmic rays with these aggressively high energies that can't be explained by other processes. My personal favorite is called the Oh My God particle. The Oh My God particle was detected back in 1991 and had an energy of 300 quintillion electron volts, or 3 times 10 to the 20 electron volts. The LHC, for comparison, reaches about 8 times 10 to the 12 electron volts, so 8 orders of magnitude smaller. It's about as much energy as in a 100 mile per hour baseball, but packed into the space of a single atom. If it had hit you, you'd probably have felt it. No man-made accelerator will ever reach close to that high. I'm actually working with a friend to put together a cosmic ray detector, so at some point we'll revisit cosmic rays so that we can see how we can detect various types. If all goes well, we should be able to pick up some rare particles like muons. We probably won't detect any oh my god particles, but we'd still be able to explore all sorts of cool phenomena. The funny thing is that nature is and probably always will be the best particle accelerator, so a lot can be learned about high energy physics by simply pointing the right kind of telescope skyward. So those are Wakefield accelerators, an amazingly simple device that one day could mean desktop size accelerators as powerful as the LHC. Just imagine the science we could do with something like that. And with that, I'll wrap up the. Hello. Okay, guys, so we will wrap up here and uh, we can put your questions or continue the discussions on chat and we'll reply to it. Anushka, is there anything else you're supposed to tell them? Everything is done. Stop the recording. Attendance is automatically taken by Teams, I think.
Thank you for joining.